Good morning, everyone. So we are on the final part of our returning home series. I heard a woohoo. I hope that's a good thing. Rather than oh, finally, this guy. Come on. Anyway, but yeah, it's, it's the final part, part four in our returning home series, where we're looking at um, the storyline of the Bible. At least one theme in the storyline of the Bible where God is bringing His people back home. When you think of the word home, generally people think of a location, right? You probably think of a house or a country. You think of a physical location. And when we've been talking about home, besides the first session when we're talking about Eden, the Garden of Eden, we haven't really been talking about a physical location. When you think of the church, like you and I, we don't really have, when you think about salvation and what we have in Christ, usually people don't think about a physical land that we're going to possess or inherit. But when you read the story of the Bible, especially in the Old Testament with Israel, the land, the possession of the land is a huge deal. It forms a huge part of their relationship with God. In fact, the land was a reflection of their relationship with God. So when the land was prospering, when it was abundant, and when they were possessing it, it reflected that well, everything was good between them and God. When the land was suffering drought or famine or invaded by marauding raiders or wild beasts, or when they were dispossessed from the land, it signaled to them that something was wrong with their relationship with God. There was something off, right? They were being unfaithful, or God was angry with them, or something like that, right? So the, the condition of the land reflected their relationship with God. And the land, the possession of the land was a huge deal, is still a huge deal for the nation of Israel. But what about us as New Testament believers, as the church? What about us? Is there a land that we are to inherit? Is it the physical land of Jerusalem? Should we all go in there and march in and go, this is our land, this belongs to us? Is that what we're meant to do? No, obviously not, right? We did that and it didn't turn out well. But, um, but I believe that God has not forgotten about this aspect of the land. Even for the New, even for the New Testament church, us, believers, the church, we have a land that we are going to inherit. We have a physical land that we are going to possess. Now, we have something great already, that is Jesus Christ. He is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And because we are in Him, we are the body of Christ, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's amazing. You have the blessings of God, the spiritual blessings of God are with us. But there's this comp land component that we're still, I suppose, waiting for. And that's what we're gonna to cover today. That's what we're gonna look at today. That I believe this land component, the land that we're going to inherit is called the New Jerusalem. And that is when we are, will finally be completely back home with the Lord. So, we're gonna to turn to Revelation chapter 21. And we're gonna go all the way to chapter 22 verse five. But we're gonna skip a huge portion of it because there's just so much in here. Um, I, honestly, I would love to dig into it and really unpack it, but unfortunately, I only have like 40 minutes if we're generous. Okay, so we're gonna select some passages, some, some verses, and we're gonna look into that. Okay, so Revelation chapter 21, starting from verse one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Now we're gonna jump to verse 22, okay? All the way down to verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the, lamp, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, verse one. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, 
bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will be there any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, what a glorious future we look forward to. Oh Lord, I pray the, the things that you want to impress upon us as we gaze just for a moment on this glorious future, may they be impressed upon us by the Holy Spirit. I pray that you reveal to us what you need to reveal to us personally, not just as a congregation, but personally, for individually, the things that need to be grasped in our hearts will be grasped. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll be our teacher, ultimately. So God, show us what home is like. Show us what we have to look forward to. And may our hearts long for it, but also, um, Lord, I pray, may we have this sense of urgency as we, as we gaze upon um, our new home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't, what, what, what do you think of when you think of heaven or when you think of the eternal life that you're gonna have with God? What, what image comes to your mind? It might be something like the Sistine Chapel where there's babies flying around with little wings and playing harps and some have little bows um, and you're up in the clouds somewhere. Um, or maybe it's um, something like a church service. I remember a long time ago, a worship leader or a pastor, I can't remember who, no one in this church, but someone said to me something like, you know, hey, you better like worshiping, musically worshiping in church because you're gonna spend eternity doing that. And I remember thinking at the time, this was a long time ago, okay, I was young. I was thinking, I don't really wanna do that. <laughs> I wanna do other stuff, you know. Um, now, now, when we look at the final pages of scripture, we see something totally different. We don't see us ascending to heaven into the clouds where we are jumping on clouds like trampolines. What we see instead is heaven descending onto the earth. More specifically, we see heaven and earth combining into one. Right now, we live in a state, last week we covered, right? We live in a state where there's a mixture. It's almost like it's a mixture of heaven and, heaven and hell, almost. We have glimpses of heaven, the kingdom of God breaking through, but we also have a lot of pain, a, a lot of abuse, a lot of things that go wrong in this world. It's because there's, there's a mixture almost of heaven and hell on the earth. We experience a glimpse of both. But when the throne of God comes and descends, all that bad stuff will be pushed away. And only the good, only what is glorious, only what is perfect, only what is good in God's presence will remain on the earth. And what will happen is everything will be made new. The old order of things will pass away and something new will take its place. And the description that we get, and there's a lot here, what I wanna to highlight to you, the description that we get is, is Eden restored. In chapter 22, it very specifically talks about a river of life. What do you remember, if you remember, all the way back to the description of the Garden of Eden? What is there flowing through the Garden of Eden to water the garden and the nations and the region around it? There was a river, right? They split off into four, into four other rivers, right? There's a river of life flowing down the city of God, originating from the throne of God. It's a river of life. Lining the river, what is there? There's the tree of life. In the Garden of Eden, what stands at the center of the Garden of Eden? The tree of life, right? It's very deliberately, intentionally telling us and showing us that what we have to look forward to, our home in the future, our, the eternal kingdom that we are all gonna inherit is gonna be the Garden of Eden again. It's gonna be a garden paradise where the Lord's presence dwells. No, but no longer will the Lord dwell in a physical temple because the physical temple was required because for, to, to separate us, to act as barriers. There needed to be walls, there needed to be gates, there needed to be curtains to separate us from the holiness of God for our protection, for our safety. But in our glorious home, in the future, with God, there will be no need for any such barriers, for any such separation. The Lord and all His glory, 
all His holiness, all His perfection will be on full display. We will be able to experience it. We'll be able to bask in it because we'll be made new with Him. And so we don't need a sun anymore. We don't need lights anymore. The Lord will be our light and we will live in His glorious light forever and ever. The gates will no longer be shut into the city. Why? Because there's no night. There's no need for any guards or security. You'll have gates to protect yourself. The gates are gonna be wide open. Why? Because there's gonna be no danger anymore. And this glorious future that we have to look forward to when heaven and earth meet and the earth is totally made new and we are totally made new with a glorious new body. Can't wait for that, right? That's gonna be awesome. When we get that, there's gonna be no pain, no suffering. No death, because where the Lord is, there's only good. Where the Lord is, there's only perfection. Where the Lord is, there is no crying, there is no grief, there's only joy, there is perfect peace, and that is our glorious future. Sound awesome? Sounds amazing, sounds amazing, and that is why throughout scripture, right, and we covered, touched on it briefly last week, Christians, we are meant to eagerly hope for this future. We're going to eagerly hope for this future because as good as life can get now, right, the, the, as good, if your life is perfect now, it is nothing compared to this. It's nothing compared to this. And so we are meant, called to, encouraged to look to this glorious future and eagerly desire it, to eagerly desire this glorious future because it's going to be awesome. Now, what are we gonna do in this glorious future? Are we going to be in this worship service here? Is Dave or someone equivalent gonna come up here and lead us in worship day in, day out? He has no break anymore. Is that, is that what's gonna happen? In verse, um, in chapter 21, verse 24 to 26, it says this, and this is, I think, very revealing of what we're gonna be doing for our eternity. Chapter 21, verse 24 to 26. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Now, when we read this, you may have just skimmed over it, maybe you just glossed over it, but if you actually dwell on this for a moment, isn't this an odd passage? Because who are these kings all of a sudden? I thought there was one king called Jesus. But who are these kings that are gonna be bring, going about the nations, bringing their glory and splendor into this city? Who are they? Who is this referring to? Now, the author of Revelation, the Apostle John, didn't feel the need to expand on it any earlier. Um, any more, sorry. And, but I think it's because he thinks, in his mind, it is perfectly clear. May I suggest that the kings that are ref- being referred to here are referring to us. If we rewind back all the way to the Garden of Eden, what was the role of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? We were meant to be priest kings, right? Royal priests, cultivating what God was doing in the garden to spread his rule and reign across the earth to see this garden paradise spread and bloom to fill the earth. That was our, that's what God designed us to be, royal priests. Priest kings. Israel, also designed to be a kingdom of priests, to rule with God, to establish his kingdom on earth, and to serve as mediators between the divine and the rest of the nations. Then in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, it says that you're going to be, we're going to reign with him forever and ever. And the church is called the royal priesthood, the holy nation, a people belonging to God. So you piece all that together, what do you get? Who are these kings? You are. You are the kings that will rule with God and for God, and we will bring the glory and the splendor of the nations back to God and offer it as a sacrifice to Him. That makes sense? Is that awesome? We're gonna be the kings, but reigning with God. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, so if we're kings, that's pretty cool. Who are the subjects? 
Great kings, who are the subjects? It's a great question. We must be careful to not superimpose our understanding of what it means to be a ruler onto Scripture. Rulers, leaders, kings in this, or queens in this world have subjects who serve them. They order something and the subjects obey them, okay? That's how rulers work. But how do rulers work in God's kingdom? What does the highest in the kingdom of God do? They serve, right? The higher you go, the more you serve, right? So what happens when you get a whole bunch of kings in the kingdom of God in a room together? What happens? You don't get bickering. You don't get a debate of going, hey, I, I, I am better than you. I think I serve God more than you. I, you serve me. No, you don't get that. Now, that's what you get on earth. But in heaven, what do you get? In the kingdom of God, what do you get? When you get a whole bunch of kings together, what do you get? You get a room full of people that are looking about how to serve one another. When you get a whole bunch of kings together, you're getting, everyone is looking and jockeying to, hey, how can I serve you more? No, 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 let me serve you. No, no, I insist, I need to serve you. You get that debate, you get that discussion, right? So what is the earth gonna be filled like when we are there as kings? Who are the subjects? There are no subjects. There are no subjects because we are all serving one another. We are all serving one another. And that is how we rule with Christ. We rule by service. And that is why even now, even now, in our present situation, the Apostle Paul and the Apostles and all the letters, what do they instruct us to do? To serve one another in love to forgive one another, to bear with one another, to love one another. Why? Because that's what we're gonna be doing for eternity. That is what we're gonna be doing for eternity. Because that is how we rule in the kingdom of God. And so we are going to be spending eternity using what we have to spread the rule of God's kingdom by serving one another, and by ruling over creation to bring flourishing, healing, and goodness across the entire earth with God, for God, and we'll bring that back to God to offer it as a holy sacrifice to Him, to bring Him glory and honor. Now, I wonder how you're feeling when you gaze upon this glorious future of what you're gonna be doing. Maybe some of you are thinking, Man, I just want to relax in my mansion when I get to heaven. You know, I, I'm done working. I'm done serving. I serve now so that I can relax in the future. Um, what we must understand is um, the kind of future that we have is, is not like now where we, when we serve, sometimes it's Painful, sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes people don't, aren't very grateful. Sometimes people aren't very responsive to our service to them. Sometimes we do things, we serve, we give, we pour our life, and nothing seems to happen. But in this eternal kingdom, it's gonna be restful work. It's gonna be kind of like what we saw in the Garden of Eden, where God creates and humans just cultivate. Where we just do what God has already set up for us to do. And that's the kind of paradise we're gonna live in. Where imagine you doing what you love to do day in, day out. Imagine you doing what you're good at, what brings you fulfillment, what brings you satisfaction. Imagine doing that every single day. Where everything you touch, when you, when you serve, when you work, it just brings flourishing and it brings you joy and you see people strengthen and built up and their lives flourish because of what you have done. We're gonna spend eternity doing that. And that's why it's gonna be filled with restful work as we rule with Christ. Is that okay? Yeah, are you happy about that? Not happy about that? <laughs> On the fence? Have I done it justice? I don't know if I've done it justice. But anyway, you'll experience it eventually. <laughs> but man, it's something to get excited about. And I'm, if I haven't done it justice, I apologize. But 
man, this is what we're gonna be spending eternity doing. And how does this affect us right now? How does this affect how we live right now? Well, our present life is preparation to rule and serve in the eternal kingdom. Our present life, the life that you live right now, is preparation for your, to rule and reign with Christ in the eternal kingdom. This life is our training ground. We catch a glimpse of heaven on earth right now when, the, when we function, truly function as the loving church to one another, to the world, we catch a glimpse of heaven here. But this is training, training, preparation. It is God uh, refining us, sanctifying us, preparing us of how to rule with Him because we're gonna be spending eternity doing that. And Jesus says this. Jesus gives us a glimpse of this in a few parables. For example, in the parable of the talents or the parable of the bags of gold. In Matthew chapter 25, He gives bags of gold to his servants, and he goes away on a long trip, right? This master goes away on a long trip. And when he returns, he comes back and expects, okay, so what have you done with the bags of gold I have given you? And listen to what, how he responds to the servants that make some more money. So one servant has five bags of gold, and he goes, master, you gave me five, I got five more. How does the master re- respond to this servant? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, so I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. In a similar parable, in Luke chapter 19, right, a similar parable, this is been said, it's this king, it's this master who goes away on a long trip and he's made king, and when this king comes back, he goes, what have you done with the money that I've given to you? And so the first servant came and said, sir, your money, your mina, has earned 10 more. Master replies, well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy or faithful in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. So one little bag of gold has expanded to 10 cities. The second came and said, sir, your money has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. So what do we see here? What's the point that Jesus is trying to make? Jesus is telling us this, that our faithfulness with little now will lead to a reward of us leading and ruling over much with him in the eternal kingdom. Your faithfulness now will lead to responsibility over much with him in the eternal kingdom. What are we entrusted with though? What are we entrusted with? Well, I think there are three things in our lives that we're entrusted with, three broad categories of things. Firstly, they're natural things. These are natural abilities, talents, gifts, resources, opportunities. Some of you, you're natural entrepreneurs. You, some like building things, fixing things, creating things. Others like researching. You like expanding your knowledge and expanding the knowledge of other people. These are things that God has naturally given to you to bless and strengthen the community around you and the world around you. It's natural things. Natural things, just given to you by God. Second thing is supernatural things. There's supernatural gifts that God has given to you. And some may seem more natural than others. Some may seem very supernatural, like words of knowledge or prophetic gifts. Others may seem more natural, like leadership or hospitality. But the the thing that differentiates between a natural thing and a supernatural thing is when it comes under the power of God, when it comes under the use of the Holy Spirit, that thing, whether it's hospitality, leadership, teaching, when it's under the submission of the Holy Spirit, it blesses, strengthens, and leads people closer to Christ. That's what, that's what makes it supernatural. That's what makes it supernatural. So there's a range of gifts that we all have. Everyone here has gifts. Everyone here has bags of gold that God has given to you, and when we activate and harness these gifts, people are blessed. People are blessed. When one believer really is faithful in sowing their gift to bless the people around them, people are strengthened. The river of life flows through them and people are blessed. For example, and this is just to highlight one gift, but there's so many. For example, many of you here have the gift of hospitality, right? 
You have the gift of hospitality. It means that when people enter your house, it feels like they've entered the second home, right? And it's, and it's very, I mean, we're all called to be hospitable, right? We're all called to be, called to be hospitable. But there's something different when someone with the gift of hospitality harnesses and uses their gift to bless others. For example, if you come to my house, okay, I'll try to be hospitable to you, right? You want water? Sinks right there. Help yourself. You hungry? Hey, I've got bread in the freezer, just toast it and use the spreads that I've got. It's all yours. What I have is yours. I'm being very hospitable, right? Take whatever you want, right? But I do not have the gift of hospitality. When someone has the gift of hospitality, before you even think that you are hungry, piping hot food comes before you. Would you like some pie? I freshly baked this. Before you, the moment you think, hey, I'm feeling a bit parched. Would you like some tea? I got this from, I don't know, from China. It's very good jasmine tea. You know, it's, it's amazing that they feel, you feel warm. Not only do you feel warm, not only do you feel comfortable, you catch a glimpse of the love of God in this person, through this person. That's, a, that's just a glimpse. This is one example when someone Anyone here activates their gift, uses their gift, uses that bag of gold. Some of you think it's insignificant. I've only got the gift of hospitality. Sure, people feel welcome in my home. What can that do? You can spread the love of Christ when you activate it. When you use it, it blesses people. It blesses people. And that's the power. That's what we're called to do. Your faithfulness with little, this little thing that you have, will lead to a ruling over much, ruling over much. The third category of things that we're entrusted with are people, people. And I think this is the most important category of all. In fact, our natural gifts and our supernatural gifts are all for the purpose of blessing and building up people, people. In First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 19, Paul says, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? And it says something very similar in Philippians chapter four, verse one. See, for Paul, the crown of his ministry would not be the number of mission trips he, plan he, he went on, would not be the number of churches he planted, it would be the people, the individuals, the faces, the lives of the people that he had interacted with, that he had prayed for, that he had ministered to, that he had discipled, they would be his crown of glory. When he's, in his mind, he stood, he, he pictured himself standing before the master and the crown, his reward, the thing that would be celebrated was not all the gifts, oh, you did this, you did that, you organized this, you organized that, no it would be the lives. People will be marched before him and be, he would see the number of lives that would have been impacted by his life. That was his crown of glory. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is not so much what has the Lord entrusted to you, but who has the Lord entrusted to you? Who has the Lord entrusted to you? Who has the Lord placed in your path, in your life, that you can bless, that you can bring closer to Christ with what he has given you? Now, for some, it's very obvious. For some people, it's very obvious. For example, if you are a ministry leader, if you're a volunteer, if you're a connect group leader, very obvious. There are people that God has placed in your life for the season to shepherd, to care for. And we need to take this seriously because these are the bags of gold that the, the precious, the precious lives that God has given to us, entrusted to us for the season, to disciple, to strengthen, to lead closer to Him. What are we gonna do with our bags of gold? For others, uh, for example, parents. Parents, who are your bags of gold? Your kids, right? Your kids. We only have them for a short period of time. 
it can sometimes feel very long, but we actually only have them for a very short amount of time where we get to invest our lives, where we get to disciple them, where we get to teach them about Jesus, about the Lord. And that is why in Deuteronomy chapter six, it says, teach these, the law of the Lord, teach the ways of God to your children. Talk about it when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Does that mean that we need to constantly read the Bible every single time when they sleep? We read the Bible when they get up. We read the Bible when we walk along the road. We, we read the Bible. Is that what it means? Or rather, does it mean that in every part of your life, your life, how you live, how you talk, how you act, how you behave, every part of your life should be a living testimony of who God is to your children. That when you, whether you sit at home or whether you're outside walking along the road, when you're lying down to rest, or whether you're getting up doing something, everything that you do is communicating the message of the gospel to your kids, so that they not only hear what you say, but they see how you live. And they learn, they see it, they see it modeled. And that's the task that we, that's a privilege these are the bags of gold that the Lord has entrusted to us for this season. But even if you're not a leader, volunteer, mentor, or parent, we all have people in our lives that the Lord has put and placed and entrusted to us, colleagues, friends. We have people that the Lord has put in our path. How can we use what the Lord has given to us to bless, edify, strengthen, disciple, lead this person towards Christ, regardless of whether they are Christian or not. What can we do to bless this person? Will they be a jewel in your crown when you stand before the master? Or will there be a regret when you stand before the king? You know, I think there are two big obstacles when we think about that people face in being faithful to what God has entrusted to them. You know, when you think about, you know, the people that God has placed in your care, or when you think about what the Lord has given to you, sometimes there can be a tinge of hesitation, reluctance. Maybe there can be a, a feeling of lethargy. Or I don't know what you're feeling right now, but maybe there is this hesitation, there's this obstacle that you're facing that, you know, I know, I, there's, there's names that are coming to mind, there's faces that are coming to mind, but um, there's something that's stopping me from doing it. There's this hesitation. I think there are two big obstacles to um, using these bags of gold, to sowing these bags of gold that the Lord's entrusted to us. The first obstacle, I think, is fruitlessness. Fruitlessness. Sometimes it can feel as though you are pouring out your life, you're caring for people, you're loving on them, you are serving them, you are using what God has given to you, you've been generous with them, but nothing seems to be happening. When that happens, for, especially for a prolonged period of time, it can, sometimes you can get to the stage where you begin asking yourself, what is the point? What's the point of all this? Because nothing seems to be happening, there seems to be no outcome, there seems to be no fruit. Maybe you're actually worried that you're gonna face the master, the king, God, and you're gonna be left with nothing. Lord, I was faithful, I swear. I did all that I could, but no one listened. No one responded. There is no fruit. I tried, I invested, but nothing happened. Fruitless, fruitlessness, the fear of fruitlessness sometimes can be an obstacle for us stepping out in faith and in obedience. My encouragement to you is this. If you're feeling that today, is simply don't be concerned about the fruit. Let's move on. No, no, don't be concerned about the fruit. Do you realize that in both parables, Matthew 25, Luke chapter 19, that it was not fruitfulness that was celebrated, but faithfulness? The master didn't go, well done, good and fruitful servant. You did so much, well done. What did he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. It's almost like, in Jesus' mind, faithfulness will lead to fruitfulness. It will. It's a natural consequence, natural result. 
when you use what I've given you faithfully, obediently, you will produce a harvest of righteousness. You will, guaranteed. But why is it then that sometimes we don't see that? I mean, if you are a leader, if you have served in church in any capacity, you know what I'm saying, right? You serve, you give, you think you're being obedient, right? You're faithfully serving these people and man, nothing seems to be happening. This person is exactly the same as when you met them five years ago, right? Nothing seems to be happening. What is going on? I think it's not, I, I, I believe it's because we don't have the appropriate tools to measure fruitfulness. See, naturally, as humans, we measure fruitfulness in the, in the space of days, weeks, years, maybe if you're patient, decades, right? We look at a ministry and go, wow, that guy, he's, his church is booming. Oh, look at that mentor, mentoring so many people. Look at their lives that are being impacted by this one person, amazing. But then we look at the, over the, that, that mother over there and go, that mother's not doing anything. She's just caring for her kids. Not very fruitful. I don't think we have the tools necessary to evaluate and measure your fruitfulness and the fruitfulness of people on the earth. Because I don't think God measures fruitfulness in the space of days, months, weeks, years. I believe he measures fruitfulness in light of eternity. In light of eternity. For example, take the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, right? If you look at his earthly ministry, he was very unsuccessful. Because as a prophet, he was meant to prophesy to the nation, uh, right? To come back to God, to repent. How many people repented? No one. No one listened to him. If you on earth, with Isaiah, I have a feeling we would all want to counsel him, Isaiah, you need to change your tactics. Try something different. Are you sure God really wanted you to do that specific thing? How about you alter your delivery a bit, make yourself more engaging, right? If you look at his earthly ministry, he was wildly unsuccessful, very unfruitful. But would we consider Isaiah unfruitful? Absolutely not. Who in the right mind would do that? Because Isaiah, to this day, is ministering to people. To this day, his prophecies are building people up. His prophecies are still bearing fruit. Not only that, do you know that Isaiah has the most messianic prophecies? Prophecies about Jesus out of any single Hebrew prophet. He's the most. Would we call him unfruitful? Absolutely not. Because you cannot measure fruitfulness in the space of months, years, days, weeks, decades. You cannot do that. You can only measure it in the light of eternity. Therefore, what are you called to do? What are we called to do? Faithful. Faithful. Now, I'm not saying there's no space for evaluating, for improving, for altering your tactics and delivery. I'm not saying any of that. There's wisdom in that. But what I'm saying is, if you are genuinely being faithful with what God has entrusted to you, you are faithfully loving the community around you, regardless of how they respond, you're sharing the love of Christ, you're having these faith conversations with your friends, in the best way you can, you're being faithful and obedient, but you're not seeing any fruit that's okay. Because it's hard for you to gauge the level of your fruitfulness. All you, all you need to be concerned about is, are you being faithful? And let God be the measure of your fruitfulness. Because my guess is that if you are faithful with this little bit, you will be surprised by the number of jewels in your crown when you stand before the master you'll be surprised by the number of people that will be celebrating with you as you stand before him and going, this person blessed my life. I am here because of this person. If you are faithful with little, you'll be rewarded with much. Therefore, keep being faithful. If you're wondering what is the point I've been faithfully serving for years, as long, for as long as the Lord is saying, keep going, then keep going, keep going, keep being faithful. Keep being faithful to what and who God's entrusted to you because it will lead to fruitfulness. And you will hear, 
you will hear the master saying, well done, good and faithful servant. The second obstacle, I believe, is fear. Fear. And sometimes it, it, the fear is, doesn't, doesn't seem like fear at first. Sometimes the internal monologue you have is, it's too hard, it's too difficult, or I can't be bothered. It's, it's, it's a bit too uncomfortable for me. When we have this internal monologue, I want to stop on faith. I know the people that God is placing in my life. I, I, I feel it and I, I, how I can be faithful to the Lord in the eyes of God that God has given me. But it's, it's too hard. It's too hard. May I suggest that the actual reason for your hesitation is not, it's not difficulty. The problem is not how difficult things are because people are willing to do many difficult things in life. For example, changing jobs is not an easy thing, yet many people do it, right? Many of you have done it before. Moving house, very inconvenient, not easy, but many of you do it. Some of you, this is not your place of birth. This is not your country where you grew up in. You moved countries, that is far from easy, yet you did it. Difficulty is less of an obstacle than we sometimes think. So oftentimes, the feeling of it is too hard is actually a mask for the real feeling of I am afraid. I am afraid. Listen to what the third servant in our parables says to the master. Then another servant came and said, sir, here is your money. Here's your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. What did he say? I was afraid of you. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. What was the third servant afraid of? I think he was simply afraid of failure. Failure. Fueled by his misconception of his master being a harsh and merciless ruler, he was afraid of losing the one thing that had been given to him. He was afraid of using it because he was afraid of losing it, right? He was afraid of using it because he was afraid of losing it. Some believers, maybe some of you, are really struggling or have really struggled with stepping out in faith to use what God has given you or to bless, or maybe to have conversations with people that God has placed in your life because you are afraid that you will stuff something up. Maybe you're afraid that you make things worse. Maybe you're afraid that you are not good enough. I don't have that, all the answers to people's questions. I'm not, I'm, I'm a bit awkward as a person. Oh, I don't know what to do. What do I say to this person? That is not, the problem is not, it's too difficult. The problem is we are actually afraid of failing. And sure, if God is a harsh taskmaster that demands nothing less than perfection, then yeah, we should be afraid. We should be afraid. But this is where the third servant got it wrong. His warped perception of the master led to a misplaced fear of failure. Case in point. Um, the other day, I asked my two-year-old daughter to carry a plate of her food from the bench top to the dining table. Okay? Now, I know what I've asked her to do. I know what she's capable of. She's two, year old, two years old, I give her the plate, and I see that she's holding it like that, okay? She is very excited, very happy. She's waddling along, but the food is almost gonna fall out. So I'm having to almost carry it the entire way. I'm having to, Adara, just be careful, just watch where you're going, but she's two years old. She can't focus on multiple things at once. So she's either focusing on the food, she's either focusing on walking, or she's focusing on the dining table, right? She can't focus on all things at once. So I'm having to help her the entire way to bring the plate of food to the dining table. I know what I've asked her to do, and I know what she's capable of. Of course, I do not expect her to carry the plate all by herself on her first try to the dining table. Because I know what she's capable of. I know the dining table is too high. I know she can't focus on multiple things at once. I know that she is two years old. 
But do you know what happens when she carries the plate to the dining table? Regardless of whether she's dropped it, regardless of whether I've had to help her carry it the entire way, do you know what happens when she carries it to the dining table, the plate to the dining table? We are celebrating. We're celebrating. Yes, you carried the plate. Well done. You did it. You carried the plate. Do you not think that the Lord knows what he's asked you to do? Do you not think that he knows what you are capable of? Do you not think that he knows that you feel awkward talking to people about Christ? That you feel that you do not have all the answers? Do you not think he knows that you feel inadequate, like you don't have it all together in your life? How on earth are you going to mentor someone else? He's not asking you to carry the plate to the dining table on the first try. All he's asking you to do is, will you carry the plate? Will you carry the plate? And for those who are simply willing to carry the plate, just carry the plate. There's going to be a huge cry of celebration. Regardless of whether you've dropped it, regardless of whether you shared the gospel and someone has broken down weeping in tears or whether that person has replied with, cool man. Regardless of the outcome, regardless of the outcome, God is going to be celebrating those who have simply carried the plate. We sometimes are so scared of failing. Sometimes we are so scared of letting God down. What will God think of me? Because I can't do this. He knows this. Well, maybe that's the whole point. Because remember, this life is training ground for how we rule with Him in the future. Maybe He's looking for people, the people that will simply carry the plate, be faithful to what He's given to them. Because you know what? That's how you rule with Him. That's how you rule with Him. When you start using what God has given you, when you start simply stepping out in faith, faithfully and obediently blessing the people around you in the, in the maybe flawed way you know how, that's you serving people. That's you loving on people. That's you starting to embrace your role as a priest king in the kingdom of God. And God is looking upon you and going, well done good and faithful servant. You have been willing to carry the plate. Come, let's stand. Let's stand. And I think today is simply the call for people to start carrying plates. Some, today is the call for people to start carrying plates. Maybe you have been hesitant. Maybe you've been fearful. Maybe you've thought, it's too difficult. I don't know where to start. Today, the Lord is saying to you, hey, will you just be faithful to what I've given you? Just take that step of obedience and carry the plate and let me judge your fruitfulness. Let me handle the fruit. You just be faithful. So if that's you, if you're saying today, Lord, I want to carry the plate. I want to carry the plate. I don't know how. I'm going to do it. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to be faithful to what you have given me. If that's you, can I invite you down to the front? We would love to pray for you. We would love to pray for you. I also want to pray for people who have been faithfully serving, who have been giving of your life, whether in church or outside the church. It doesn't just mean in church. Maybe you've been praying for your workplace for a long time. You feel that you've been doing this for a long time but you're feeling, what is the point? What is the point? You're getting a bit tired. I also wanna pray for you. I, I want us as a church to pray for you, that you'll be strengthened, that you'll be strengthened in the Lord to keep going, to keep pressing on, to keep being faithful so that you too will hear the cry of the master, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful a little, now rule with me. Over much. Hey, if that's you, those two things, come down to the front. 
okay? Let me pray for you as we respond. Oh Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for this glorious future that we have prepared for us. But Lord, now, Lord, you've given us this task of faithfulness, of faithfulness. Oh Lord, I pray, may we, may we be faithful. May we be faithful today. May you show us, reveal to us the people in our lives that you have placed on our path. May you give us a glimpse of how we can bless them, how we can strengthen them, how we can bring them closer to you, how we can use what we have to, to serve you, to strengthen people, to lead them closer to you. Reveal that to us, Lord, and show us. And as we carry the plate, oh Lord, may we catch a glimpse, oh Lord, of the joy of the Father over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond.